Okay, it's uh, 5.31, so we shall get started. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this virtual community lecture focusing on men's health. My name is Daniel Vela, and I'm the Periop Business Manager for both Torrance and San Pedro, and we're joined by expert urologist, Dr. Asghar Asghari. Before we get started, I want to let everyone know that this is an hour-long presentation, and we will have plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the question, the Q&A box to type in any questions you have throughout the events, and we'll do our best to get to each question at the end of the presentation. We will not be opening it up for attendees to speak on this webinar. Before I introduce our first speaker for this evening, I want to share with you some of the men's health services that we offer here at Providence Little Company Mary in Torrance. Um, one service is gastroenterology, cardiology, bariatric surgery, orthopedics, rehabilitation services, mental health, and of course, the reason why we're all here today, prostate health and urology. And for more information about these services, please visit the URL in the chat box. Lastly, I want our attendees to know that the information provided during this program is for educational purposes only. You should always consult your healthcare provider if you have any questions regarding a medical condition or treatment. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Asghar Asghari. Dr. Iskari is a board certified and expert urologist and is affiliated with multiple hospitals in the area, including Providence Little Company Mary Medical Center in Torrance and San Pedro. He received his medical degree from Tehran University of Medical Sciences School of Medicine and has been in practice for more than 20 years. Dr. Iskari is committed to providing the highest quality of care to his patients and diagnosis and treatment options, including the most minimally invasive surgical procedures for urology related conditions. Dr. Iskari is dedicated to offering patients a wide range of quality urology services in a warm and friendly environment to provide the very best urologic care. Dr. Iskari? Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you joined me for this uh, evening talk. Uh, I'm a plumber, as you know it, as a urologist, we call us plumber. And tonight we are going to talk about some of the plumbing system. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, I'll be able to uh, give you enough, enough information about that. Our agenda tonight is what is the prostate in general? Because prostate disease is something uh, any man can face it after age 50. I'm talking about enlarged prostate. And we should know about the, a little bit about anatomy of the prostate, how we can treat it, what's the symptom, et cetera. And also um, tonight I'm going to talk about the new technology we have in the urology now, which is uh, uh, probably the least uh, invasive treatment of the prostate if the medication doesn't fail. Next, please. Next is so. You know, overall prostate gland is a genital gland. It's a, not, it's a small gland with a size of walnut between 15 and 25 gram. And its function is only produce semen. A man ejaculate, ejaculate come from prostate, not from testicle. Testicle only contribute sperm to that ejaculate. So the prostate function is provide the ejaculate, provide the semen, provide the fluid, which can carry this, uh, carries the sperm through the urethra to the vagina for its function, its main uh, purpose, which is a fertility and producing the children. So prostate is not a vital organ. If you remove prostate from somebody, nothing happened to him except when it, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, enjoyment or when it comes to climate, no fluid coming out. And also he won't have any um, ability to have a children, but, but prostate, that's functional process, only this is gland. That's why location wise is another problem with the prostate. It's, it's located deep in the pelvic area. And if you consider bladder like a balloon, which balloon has a, uh, you know, that makes you, you blow through it, that neck connected to the prostate and prostate connected to the, we call it a bladder neck or neck of the bladder. And urethra, like a tunnel, pass through this gland and continue to go to the uh, rest of the, rest of the uh, penis, we call it the um, uh, penal urethra. So the prostate encase the urethra in that, in that area. So any pathology of the prostate will cause problem with urination and which I'm talking about later. And the location wise is a little bit awkward location and 
urethra pass through it, like somebody has make a tunnel. So any squeeze of the prostate from outside over the urethra, narrow it and cause pro um, problem urination. Next, please. We have three kinds of the problem with the prostate. Prostatitis, BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy, that's, that's the one I'm talk talking tonight. This is a benign enlargement of the prostate, of course, cancer of prostate. Among these three, prostatitis is mainly for young people. Uh, they get UTI, they get some other urethritis and bacteria go to the process, causes pain, bleeding, sometimes fever, chills, some of them. Prostate cancer also is a different issue. I'm not gonna talk about it, but also this is the most common cancer in men, but it's not the most common problem in men. Most common problem with the prostate created for male is enlarged prostate. Almost everybody past age 50 gets some degree of enlarged prostate. As we get older, the chance is higher. And enlarged prostate, since prostate encases the urethra, pushing the urethra, causing narrowing of the urethra. So the urine flow become slower and all the symptoms follow by that. Next, please. As you see in this slide, the prostate doesn't have any function before puberty. If you castrate anybody before puberty, his prostate doesn't develop because testosterone which is produced by testicle is important for growth of the prostate. So after puberty, as we get older, the prostate gets enlarged and bigger. Next, please. In this slide shows that when you're age 50, 60% of the people in that age group might have the large prostate. But at age 80, almost 90%. Again, it doesn't mean having enlarged prostate, you have blockage problem. No, I, I alluded to that later on. But it shows that as we get older, the size of prostate get big. And that's the rule. Next, please. BPH of benign, benign prostatic hypertrophy is something as non-cancerous. A lot of studies done in urology about people who are uh, have infection or other problem with the prostate. There have not been any proof that any predisposing factor element present to cause enlarged prostate. Enlarged prostate, nobody knows why it, it, our prostate get bigger. The only thing I mentioned to you, there's a relationship between the hormone of the testosterone hormone and growth of the prostate at puberty. And later, we don't know. We don't really don't know why people get enlarged prostate. I'm sure you have heard about PSA, PSA prostatic specific condition. That's an enzyme produced merely by prostate, but it's not 100% uh, since sensitive, you can have a large prostate increase PSA because every gram of tissue you have enlarged in your prostate increase the PSA. So if you have a large PSA, or I'm sorry, elevated PSA in large prostate can be totally normal without having any cancer. So one of the things that people get in, get worried about when they get in large, in large prostate with elevated PSA, however, that has to be investigated. But I'm saying that elevated PSA is not uncommon with enlarged prostate. Next, please. If you look at this slide, um, as I mentioned to you, this on the, uh, my left side, that's normal prostate. You see the location of the prostate right at the neck of the bladder. Urethra is wide open. So bladder has no problem. It doesn't have any, uh, any difficulty to pass the urine through the urethra. But as the process in the other, on the right side, as the process starts to get enlarged, it push urethra from outside, make it narrower, make it smaller, and it causes bladder has to function more. It squeeze more, press more urine through the urethra by hyperactivity of the bladder muscle. And bladder is starting to get some changes, we call it trabulation. So, the normal prostate is not a problem for bladder at all. Normally, urine come, fill up the bladder, bladder has a nice wide open urethra pass through. But enlarged prostate start to cause physical problem 
for the bladder because bladder has to enforce more force to get rid of the urine. And since bladder is a smooth muscle, it starts to get trabeculation, which in terms causes bladder to get weakened and weakened. Next, please. We're talking about symptoms. You know, there are lots of symptoms associated with enlarged prostate. First of all, uh, the symptoms in enlarged prostate can be also seen in parasititis, also can be seen in uh, uh, cancer of prostate. But what is a specific one in enlarged prostate is most of the time people complain of force of urination slow down. They have to get up at night more than before. When you go to the bathroom, they don't feel they have emptied the bladder. Then they finish the urination, they go back and have to come back again. Or sometimes they have rush to go to the bathroom. They call it urgency. And sometimes even they have some pain in the pelvic area. I've seen people with bleeding come to see me for the first time. When I checked them out, I found out they have enlarged prostate. And also, if they develop some residual in the urine, sometimes the first symptoms the patient can go see is either PCP or urologist infection because urine sitting in the bladder, get infected and bring to their attention there's something wrong with their prostate. Next, please. You know, the, the problem with the enlarged prostate really affects the quality of life. Number one, most, most men at night when they get up two or three or four times, they can't sleep. The lack of sleep is one problem. The other one is whenever they're gonna to wanna to go outside to go enjoy with a friend, let's go to the restaurant, have a drink or water. First thing they have to excuse the, uh, the friend is uh, to go to the bathroom to urinate because more frequent urination. Wherever they wanna go, they have to be sure there's a bathroom available to them so they can reach on time. So you see that the enlarged prostate affect the quality of life. And men with enlarged prostate, which has not been treated, is not happy. It's not only slow stream, it's a lot of other problems they can associate with it. Next, please. If you look at this slide on the left side, that's a normal bladder. You see the smooth? Bladder is a smooth muscle. It's different than muscle of the legs and hands. Bladder, a smooth muscle, it means the fiber has to stick together in order to function. When there is a blockage of the urethra and bladder, we call it the trusser muscle. Bladder has to work harder, has to push more. Gradually, this, uh, this bundle is start to split. When they start to split between two bundles, it's no more uh, muscle bundle, it's mucosa. So the force of the uh, bladder in order to get rid of the urine get less and less to the point that sometimes it's so changed, changes so much, bladder doesn't have enough force to get rid of the urine and it causes permanent damage and the patient come and say, I was fine, I can't urinate now. We call it, it goes on urine retention. So we have to keep the bladder healthy as much as possible by treating the enlarged prostate. Because effect of enlarged prostate is not only on the symptoms that we suffer is on the bladder. And in long term, if the bladder gets damaged by the but by obstruction of the prostate, it's impossible to, I mean, it's not regenerable. You cannot regenerate uh, and like other, other muscles. That's why we are so concerned nobody suffer from obstructive prostate in order to damage the bladder. Next, please. How we, do, how, how we diagnose, let's say a gentleman come to me, the first thing is important is to ask, get a good history. How did it happen? What is the symptoms? And um, the other one is, of course, we ask, we, and we do rectal exam to be sure how, what is the size of the prostate? Is the prostate is soft or smooth or is not, is not soft, is not nodular, stuff like that. And next, next step, we check the urine to be sure they don't have infection. They don't have any, any other abnormality of the urine. Of course, one of the most important tests to, ev to evaluate a man with enlarged prostate is urophlometry. I'm sure 
I don't know how many of you has seen urologists. Most urologists do this test. It's a integral part of the evaluation of the large process. It means patient come with a full bladder, urine into the bowel, it's connected to computer. Like an EKG is gonna, is, is gonna print some paper, which on the paper it says how much you urinated, what is the medium, what is the, uh, the main flow of the, uh, of the maximum flow of the urine, urine, is your flow normal or abnormal? And then at the same time, after you urinated, you put the patient on the table with the ultrasound, check the blood to see any urine left behind or not. We call it post voiding residual. These two tests are very, very important to evaluate anybody with enlarged prostate which complain of obstructive symptoms. Because sometimes flow is good, patient empty the blood is fine, and those symptoms are not related, related to enlarged prostate, could be something else causing this. And of course, after uh, uh, getting inf uh, information, getting the, uh, what you call it, good diagnosis, next step is treat the patient. When you see, you see a transsexual ultrasound, the cystoscopy, they are not at the initial phase of evaluation of the prostate initial phase to make a diagnosis and give the patient treatment. Those are tests we do when we fail our treatment with medication, and then we measure the size of the prostate with ultrasound, and we scope, look at inside the urethra to see how much changes in bladder has happened and what is the anatomy of the prostate. So initially on the left side, those are the tests we do to, to diagnose the enlarged prostate, obstructive prostate. Next, please. We have also international prostate symptom score. Uh, is a paper that asks you a question about how bad is your frequency, one to five, or how, how bad is your weak extreme, one to five. And we score it at the end. Most people who have severe prostatic obstruction, which need to be treated, the score is above 20. A score 19 below is a moderate obstruction. Sometimes if uroflow is good and patient empty the bladder, we just try to watch them closely, have them become a few months and check them again. But this, this is, has been uh, created by the AUA, our academy, and uh, it's very usable on many patients. Next, please. Now we go to the treatment in large prostate. Years ago, we had medication and then surgery. Medication was, of course, initial. Any, anybody come for enlarged prostate needs to be treated. We have two kinds of medication. One, we call it alpha blocker, like Flomax, like any other stuff like that, which go and relax the muscle outside of the prostate. So when the urine comes, prostate is not under, under pressure from outside, is already relaxed by taking this medication. The other medication, which is shrinking the prostate, 50% of the time, the, the, the different, uh, I mean, different category of medication I'm talking about, they reduce the size of the prostate in 50% of the time, but you have to take it for one month and month. The primary medication is most of them cause a loss of side effects, sexual side effects, being dropping blood pressure, being tired, and etc. And then we have group of the people who need to be operated on when we, we saw the medication doesn't help. They have a loss of side effect. The euro, the euro flow showed the flow is not improving. Patient has to still get up at night many times. He's building up more and more residual in the bladder it means doesn't empty the bladder. In those situations, if you all, I'm sure all of you remember, years ago, there was Rudu Rudu job. They got TURP, go with it. Uh, instrument inside, try to resect the prostate with the loop of the resectoscope. And then it came laser, which we use different kind of laser, but the most commonly used today is green light laser. Again, we have to go destruct the prostate tissue. The only way we get rid of the obstruction at that time was to go in either by heat like laser or by resection or by vaporization going and reduce the size of the prostate from inside. So we have interfered with normal anatomy of the prostate. 
We had this problem until the new technology came, Eurolift. In this country, Eurolift came around 2010, 2011. FDA approved it in 2011, if, I, if I'm right. But other country like Australia has been done since 2006 in Europe too. So they have more experience than we have. But Eurolift has been practicing in this country since 2011. In 2019, if, I, if I'm right, our academy, AUA, reviewed five years retrospective studies of Eurolift patients. And they found out that was a great, great procedure to do. So now we have three options, medication. Many men are happy medication, they continue medication. But they want the, the, they fail the medication, they don't have to go through the surgery, which is any surgery other than Eurolift, you're interfering with tissue of the prostate. You have to cut the tissue either by heat or by resectoscope. And that changed everything, such as sexual problem, such as bleeding more, bleeding, having catheter, having a lot of, lot of issue with that. So Eurolift has been really helped us as a urologist help our patient because it's done in the office, it's done with local anesthetic, and we don't do anything to the prostate in terms of its function, its physiology. We just push the prostate to the side. Next, please. If you look at this uh, slide, you know that Eurolip usually do not need catheter. Yes, some, pe some people may be overnight, very few, but the majority of people do not need catheter. We are comparing Eurolip with other procedures. A rapid relief from the symptoms. I would say maybe two, three weeks, most people are very happy. Most symptoms are gone without taking medication. And as I mentioned, result is very good in one treatment. We don't have to do it multiple treatment versus other laser or chirp. Sometimes you have to bring the patient back in a few months. More resection. Reservation of sexual function is very important. FDA itself very much uh, uh, emphasized on that. Nothing happened to your sexual function. No ED and no retrograde ejaculation. Most of the, the surgery we do are prostate, the men, 70, 80% of the time, when they ejaculate, the ejaculate doesn't come forward, go back, because we change the anatomy. In Eurolift, nothing happened to that. And it doesn't cause any side effect. It's not like it, I've been bleeding or, because sometimes I do, I still do some lasers, some turf for certain processes size of the process. What the problem we have is continuation of the bleeding, having catheter, come to the ER, irrigated, stuff like that. We don't have this with Eurolift. And after two or three weeks, you're off the medication. You don't have any side effect on medication and your symptoms, at least according to a, in AUA study, 90% of these people have either complete symptoms has gone away or 80% of symptoms have gone away. And they're very happy about it. Only maybe 5% they might still have some symptoms and 5% might fail. In my practice, I've done many Eurolift. I have not even one failure. I have done big gland, I have done normal, I mean, normal, not normal, medium-sized gland. And all my patients, I would say 90%, 95% have been had to do that. Next, please. This is the, it shows how the Eurolift is done. If you look at the left side, two lateral lobes, which are the lobes usually cause blockage of the passage of the urine. They come and kiss, we call it kiss each other in the midline, means of obstructing. There's a small scope. First of all, you come to the office, we give you a uh, local anesthetic, and we put you on the table. There's a small scope, go through the uh, urethra until you reach the prostate. And as you see, the Eurolift ure is two sides, it's uh, uh, some, uh, some, some metal stuff. And between is a suture. If they, when they go, around, over, over top of the process and we press the gun, this, two, this suture, we will cut the suture to push the process from inside to outside. It squeeze the process between two ends of those metal, metal stuff. So process open up without cutting through it, without uh, doing any kind of surgery, you're just pushing the process to the side. If you look at the step three, 
we have, for instance, here we have four Euroleaf, two on each side. You see how wide, wide open urethra you can see without any surgery. Of course, we have sometimes we have to insert four, sometimes five, up to seven, even sometimes higher, but roughly between five to seven is the number we use to open the prostate. And it's very effective. It doesn't, doesn't cause any problems, such as when you go to an airport passing through the uh, you know, security. Uh, nobody can realize it. You still can do MRI. I have patients with this urolif. And later on, they have enlarged, I mean, this elevated PSA. I had to send them for MRI. MRI was done without any problem. As a matter of fact, the MRI, the radiologist nicely can uh, dictate it. I can see four urolif in the prostate and so on. Yes, and ne next, please. This is the urolif. As you see, it, there's two ends. On each end is a uh, like uh, a stainless steel, and between is a suture, permanent suture. As I mentioned, one one of the it comes through the instrument. When we push the instrument, one of those metal go over the prostate to the outs outside the prostate, stay there, and the other one go inside the prostate. When we cut it, these two suddenly like a spring get together and push the prostate to the side. That's the best I can describe it for you. And as I mentioned, it's done in the office and uh, is done with ease. Takes about roughly 10 or 15 minutes. And most of the patients are very comfortable to do it. There is no need for catheter. Of course, sometimes we have to, we have, to have a catheter overnight in some people, but overall 80, 90%, they go home. Of course, we ask them, we fill up the bladder, ask them to urinate, urinate in the office. When they urinate, we know they're emptying the bladder. They go home. They go home with, of course, with med some medication. Still, they still have to take their medication. After three or four weeks, we ask them to stop the medication. They come here, they urinate with good flow, no more residual, very comfortable. Most of the symptoms has gone, and gradually, up to three months, almost all symptoms they have been suffering has gone. Uh, I think that was my last slide. Is that correct? No, it's, it's one. It's, 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 this is the cystoscopy. Uh, show, show you the, with, uh, through the cystoscopy. You see on the left side, two lateral lobes. They are coming and uh, meeting each other midline, a complete occlusion. The slide after treatment, you can see that hole is the bladder neck. See how open is, how open is the urethra. I can see through the open urethra inside the bladder inside the bladder to the blood neck. This is how effective this instrument, I mean, is this technology. Believe me, it's changed a lot in our practice. I always tell my patients, um, robot has been very big help for us because robot created for us to do radical prostatectomy. Of course, other areas is using that. And this one, the second invention they use, they come and help urologists and their patients. And it's very, very effective. You should ask your urologist about Uralif, and I'm sure most urologists are doing now, and it's very, very common practice now for all urologists, and it's very effective. Don't worry about anything. You are not having anything. You you don't feel it. You don't. It's just a small stuff. Uh, some you know you, you go to the airport. Nobody can realize you had tiny small metal inside, and uh, it doesn't change anything in your uh, uh, sexual uh, habit, uh, your ejaculation is still come forward, don't get any ED or AD problem. And it's very, very effective and very recommended by most urologists, especially for our Academy American Urology Association. I think this is my last slide, right? No one more. <laughs> Keep it. So as I mentioned, this is a reiterate what, what I said, no catheter. Patients are very comfortable. There is no pelvic pain. And uh, most of the patients, I give them some motor to take a few days or five, five or seven days. And in three months, everything is improved. And I usually see my patients in two weeks. According to the uh, protocol, they want to see the patient four weeks, but I want to see the patient in two weeks because patient is happy, I'm happy. I, don't, I cannot work for four weeks. They come in two weeks, they urinate fine, they all, they all, all the complaints they have gone. 
And I usually start much earlier than four weeks, my, the, I mean, the process medication. And the study was done by AUA with last five years retrospective study. I'm sure now we can do seven years of study, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure when they're gonna do it, but that five years study was very, very supportive of Euroleaf. Next one, please. That's, that's the end of it. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, thank you so much to listening to me. I hope I alluded some to your knowledge about the process in general and its treatment. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Ascari, uh, for that interesting and very informative presentation. Um, for myself, um, I didn't know that BPH is not an indicator or predictor of cancer. So that was um, something that I learned. Um, thank you for that. Um, can open it up to see if you have any questions. And I'm sorry, before we go into the Q&A, we have a few questions for you. Sure. If you could please answer, not for the, the attendees, sorry. Sure. If you could please answer the poll that you see appear on your screen and give us your honest feedback, we would greatly appreciate. We would greatly, greatly appreciate it. And now we will go ahead and begin our Q&A. Uh, feel free to continue to ask questions in the Q&A box and we'll, we will do our best to get to them. Here. We have one question, Doctor. So far with Eurolift, is it truly permanent? Is there, if there are issues, can it be undone or taken out? You know, Eurolift is permanent, but so far I have done many of them. I have not removed any of them because it's not causing any problems. It's such a small stuff in the process. Yes, if let's say somebody, I don't know what what kind of complaint they have from Euroleaf. Let's say somebody failed Euroleaf. Let's put it this way. He has a huge prostate with Euroleaf and he's, he's not responding to it or he's not happy about it. Yes, we can go and uh, even we can laser it and take the Euroleaf very, very easily we can remove it. And uh, again, I have not done any of them yet because I have not, but I know this, this is very easily, easily can be removed by just laser the surface of the process is going to pop out very very simple and you can grab it and pull it out but i don't know why you have to take it out because it's not even it, nobody fail i mean nobody feel it believe me nobody feel the uralist after a few months maybe initially they have some frequency urgency but as soon as those symptoms gone uh, i have not had anybody call me and tell me you know i feel the uralist in my prostate even then the ejaculated feel it. I wish you were in the office and show you the, how thin it is, how small it is. But yes, you can take it out, but very simple way with, with the scoping side, use either uh, loop or laser, laser the surface and you can see under the surface coming out, put the grasper and pull it out. Okay, thank you. Um, somewhere along those lines. So it's durable for five years. Uh, this is not permanent. I'm sorry. So they're, sorry asking, they're asking oh. if it's durable. So is there a life expectancy for their Euro lift? Is it good for five years? No, a study, or, our study was only five years because as I mentioned, the FDA approved this in 2010 or 2011. Okay. And um, AUA, our academy, did five years retrospective study. Other study in Australia or other country have been much, much longer. But we cannot, we can, we have to go by the bulk of patients we have since 2011. So they went to five years, and five years have been excellent. But Eurolift in general, when you insert a Eurolift, is permanent, it's permanent treatment. However, let's say what happened, you start, there are about 10%, 15% of men after any kind of prostate surgery, including Eurolift, which is not a surgery, they start to grow more tissue in the prostate. And then you can go do more Eurolift. It's not the end of it. But those are not very big number, about 10 or 15%. Most people after first or last surgery on the prostate, unless no complication happens, they don't need to have another surgery. And Eurolift, if you fail Eurolift in terms of growing more tissue, you can go and do more Eurolift. It's still acceptable do more, more of these stitches in the past. Okay, thank you. 
I think you, you partially answered the next question, which is, I would like to know how long the Eurolift procedure lasts versus the water vapor. You know, water vapor is another, I did show it to you up, up there. Water vapor is also another option. Some urologists do it with water vapor, but the problem water vapor, water, uh, you, you have to, you have to destroy the prostate, prostate tissues. I mean, you, it's not that you really just push the prostate inside. You have to go with the pressure of water to destroy the tissue, the bulk the tissue, make it smaller. So it's another way of surgery on them. Like, you know, laser. Laser do the same thing. TUR do the same thing. Vaporization do the same thing. I was comparing the Eurolift to other options because Eurolift doesn't change anything in your prostate organ. The prostate is intact, just push, push it to the side. But uh, the, wa uh, the water, it has to, has to destroy the tissue in order to open the urethra for you. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, any condition that prohibits Eurolift for a patient? Not really. The only the only condition which I do Eurolift in the hospital is when the patient is under uh, for stand or for heart condition for pacemaker stuff like that. They are taking anticoagulation. I don't do Eurolift in the office in that situation. I do it in the hospital because I have to stop the anticoagulation. Forty eight hours. Let's say he's taking the, uh, some anticoagulation, which we stop forty eight hours before. And I want to be monitored in the hospital. That's the only time I do it in the hospital. Otherwise, no, there's no contraindication for that. But some people, I tell you, some people do not like any local stuff. Some people, uh, you know, I have patients doing vasectomy. About 10 or 15% of the people that want vasectomy, they don't want to do it in the office. They want to do it in the under some kind of anesthesia. But usually, the only time I, my indication is, People with heart condition, they are taking uh, anticoagulation, and I have to stop anticoagulation. I would like to be monitored in the hospital, and if any bleeding happened because of the, you know, anticoagulation, I'll be better controlled. That's the only only indication for me to do it in the hospital. Okay, thank you. Next question: If you begin to have more urination issues or original issues come back to set come back sometime after your left is inserted, what would be the next step? The next step is if you have, you mean more frequent urination, right? Um, it says, if you have more urination issues or original more issues urination comes back. In general, okay. I, I start to work him up again. I have him to come to the Euroflow, but the ultrasound, I see you, is retaining or not. I check his urine, do you have an infection or not? Maybe it's failed. I'm not saying 100% people on Eurolift for any procedure uh, is not 100%. But let's say he has infection, maybe infection causing a problem. So I start to work him up again. If I found that is obstructive element, so I have to I have to see where is where is obstruction. I have to scope him, look inside, and look at the area of the Eurolift. Is there any growth of tissue, or some tissue has been missed? It is possible. So uh, there are so many options available, but first we have to work him up. And to be sure these symptoms are secondary to obstruction or initial obst obstructive obstruction has not been relieved by Europe. Okay, thank you. And one question is, next question is, um, is your office located in San Pedro? Or where is your office located, Dr. Scarry? Uh, my office in one three, uh, next to the hospital, 1360 West 6th Street, Suite 185. It's a big building, all the office buildings are here. In 6th Street, yeah. Thank you. Um, next question is, how do you determine if you need the procedure if the symptoms are initially mild? On mild symptoms, you know, most of the time patient can tell me is he happy or not happy with his symptoms? I try not to put anybody on medication as much as possible if they have mild symptoms. When I was training my professor, God bless his soul, he always told me, you know, best medication is no medication and best surgery, no surgery. Don't treat lab, don't treat 
x-ray, treat the patient. He's always in my ear. If somebody come and I tell him, listen, you have to get up to twice at night, for instance. Does it bother you too much? Some people said, no. I, I, I practically, I'm retired, I don't care. Or a slow stream, eh, it's okay. If it's okay with him and mild symptoms, I don't see any damage to the bladder. I even don't give them medication. I just tell them, come back in three months, let me check you out again. Or at night, don't drink anything at night. Don't eat fruit. And most of the time, these people do well. So it doesn't mean you have, as soon as you get BPH and you have some obstructive symptoms, you have to be treated. No. Bladder emptying is very important for us, right and flow. If you empty your bladder and you have not too much symptoms, I would prefer to watch rather than do anything, even including medication. Thank you. Uh, the next question, does a small penis make the euro lift more difficult? Not at all, because we are not doing anything. I mean, the penis is the size doesn't matter. We're going through the urethra and even shorter urethra is better for me because if you have shorter, because that's the penis is smaller, so you have the shorter urethra. So we can reach the process much easier. No, it has no relationship between that and your. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a small, maybe he meant stricture, a small urethra, not the penis. Is that, is that penis or urethra? Uh, the question was penis, but you can answer urethra. Okay. If it's urethra, we have some men that have small urethra. So what we do is, first of all, the instrument we use is very small. I have not had to dilate anybody for uh, because of a small urethra. Yes, I have had patients at the stricture I have to dilate. With small urethra, I have not had anybody, I mean, any difficult to engage this size of a scope inside. But worst possible case, with a slight dilation of the penal urethra is gonna do the job. Thank you. The next question. I read about a preliminary cystoscopy needed before this is done. Is this always the case? I'm sorry, say it again, please. Sure. Uh, I read about a preliminary cystoscopy needed before this is done. Is this always the case? Well, I, I would say we have to scope the patient to be sure we are dealing with the only lateral lobes because according to uh, FDA, if you have median lobe, a little bit, I would think about it. However, it's changed now. We even treat the medium loop now. Initially, when the FDA came, FDA established diagnosis, I mean, indication for urolift with lateral lobes, which I show you on the picture. But ev we are ch everything is changing now. In some people which are uncomfortable to uh, scope them, I don't scope them. I just uh, scope them at the time of urolift. But majority of the people, yes, I usually scope to be sure I don't have any obstructive element other than prostate, like a suture. I have lateral lobes. Truly lobes are obstructed. I do not have elevated, uh, we call it high bladder neck. Different, these are different pathology. And yes, all of them need to have cystoscopy. Unless they want, they are hesitant to have cystoscopy before your lift, which I do at the same time. At the same time, you already have to scope them between the same instrument. I see that, but majority of 90%, they need to start scope before. Okay, thank you. The next question, does the water vapor destroy your sexual functionality? Anything destroy the prostate tissue? Of course, change. I'm not saying only ED. Ejaculation problem is the most common problem with Flomax and with surgery on the prostate. Most people even do not mention it. They think it's normal. What it means is when they ejaculate, ejaculate doesn't come forward in majority of cases when you destroy the prostate cells, prostate tissue actually, because the anatomy is changed. So this is the number one problem, sexual problem. And some other problem is ED itself. The man come and said, you know, my erection has been decreased. I cannot get a good full erection, much softer. It happens with, I'm not saying 100%, but 
if it's going to happen, happen with any time you destroy prostate tissue by any means, by resection, by lasering it, or by water pressure. Okay, thank you. The next question. How do we prevent from permanently damaging the bladder muscle? As soon as we can let the bladder empty itself easy, relieve the pressure of the bladder neck by decreasing the size of the prostate, by relieving the pressure of the prostate, by making the urethra, which is passed through the prostate, wide open. And bladder doesn't have to fight to get rid of the urine through the very smaller tube. And that's the best prevention. Next question. Are there residual side effects of a cystoscopy? And do you have to qualify for Eurolift, cystoscopy, uh, or ultrasound? Ultrasound is not, ultrasound doesn't tell me about uh, anatomy of the urethra, doesn't tell me about uh, anatomy of the prostate. All ultrasound tell me about size of the prostate and transsexual of, of ultrasound. And what is in the bladder in terms of uh, fluid? Is it empty or not? So ultrasound doesn't have that value as cystoscopy has that value. Cystoscopy nicely evaluate the anatomy of the urethra, anatomy of the prostate, anatomy of the bladder. Even I can see the bladder, how much damage bladder is, uh, has been done to the bladder. And of course, there's no comp comparison between cystoscopy and autism. Okay. I wonder if you meant maybe, um, does the prostate have to be a, a minimum size before using the Eurolift? Well, or if the prostate is a small size, normally a small size prostate doesn't cause any problem with urination. It could be some, might be some, something else. As I mentioned, prostate size is meant to be long, between 15 to 25 grams. But in large prostate has nothing to do with the obstruction. I have patients with 160 gram prostate since the prostate outgrow, not ingrow. When prostate outgrow and doesn't ingrow, doesn't excuse the tube, patient is fine. I have patient with 35 grams as obstructed because that five or 10 gram is start to ingrow and excuse the tube from inside. It's all depend on the size doesn't determine your worse or your better. Every year, I mean, every day I see people come for checking. Ch checking, Many of them, they have huge prostate and in rectal exam, but they don't complain of any urinary problem. The flow is good, everything's good. So prostate size is not determined to do urolift, not to do the, the urolift. Obstruction is there determination for uh, doing the, uh, I mean, treating the prostate, the obstruction. So normal, a small prostate usually do not cause problems. It's just some other symptom. I mean, those symptoms secondary to other problems such as chronic prostatitis, uh, such as overactive bladder. We have a lot of other conditions that can mimic the symptoms of, of uh, enlarged prostate. So those people usually have good flow, they empty the bladder, but they're still symptomatic. So we have different ways, mostly with medication they can be done. Okay, thank you. Next question. Is it possible that someone could wait too long to have the Eurolift procedure such that it is no longer feasible for the procedure to be done? Not at all. Even like, like before, for instance, we, we used to get a loss of retention, people come with retention, can be, you have a catheter. And we still, Initially, let's put it this way. Initially, when FDA guideline came, FDA was very, since they did not have enough information, they said a little bit has, they were hesitant about retention. Not anymore, because they, they're changing. I have done retention, people with retention, Euroleaf, of, of course. The amount, the people with retention after Euroleaf, they're going to carry catheter for at least a couple of weeks. And we asked them to come week after remove the catheter to see if they urinate or not. So the difference between people with retention and having catheter with people without retention is with people without retention, they don't need catheter. Maybe one overnight. With retention, they require the catheter because urolith has already opened the tube. So what you have to do is bring them, we call avoiding trial. Fill up the bladder, remove the catheter. 
Next time they come, they urinate better. They still have some residual. Put the catheter back, have them to come in seven days. But eventually, over 90% they urinate on their own without need to have catheter. Thank you. Next question. I heard that if the prostate is above a certain size, insurance won't approve the procedure. Have you had to deal with this? Yes. As I mentioned, so initially, uh, FDA says 70 grams. Now increase it to 100 grams. As we present more data to FDA that we are doing much bigger prostate, much bigger prostate, FDA is going to change its uh, guidelines. So as I'm saying, suddenly they jump 30 grams. I'm sure sooner or later they're going to come up with a much more, more than 100 gram tissue. Yes, I have I have problem with it with that. Thank you. Next question: Does phimosis make it harder for cystoscopy and other procedures to other procedures to urethra intervention? Phimosis. What was? It? I'm sorry, that, I didn't hear you. Is that phimosis? What's yes. it? What's the question? Phimosis. phimosis. Yeah, phimosis is a, as. Um, the gentleman asked for, he knows that phimosis is a uh, foreskin is tight. Uh, if we have to do cystoscopy, it's very simple. We can, we can dilate the phimosis in the office. You know, we can dilate, or locally, we can put some local and cut the phimosis at 12 o'clock is wide open without doing any circumcision. We just open the phimosis and we can proceed with cystoscopy. Okay, thank you. Next question. Will the euro left procedure improve your erection? Not improve, you know, unless I, I have not asked my question, but in general speaking, as I mentioned, prostate is genital organ. Prostate disease from infection to enlargement, to cancer, whatever, has effect on sexuality of the men. It causes ED. If you correct that problem, prostate is healthy, People are happier. People are a better erection in general. So that's the rule. If somebody has prostate disease, one of the complaints they have is ED. As soon as you correct it, either it's infection or it's obstruction, they come and I, again, I have not asked, but I'm, I've heard that people are very happier in sexual life. Okay, okay thank you. Are there any, I'm sorry, is your left under sedation? Yes. A patient come to the office, we fill up the bladder with, uh, no, uh, we call it 2% of xylokine, which is a numbing medicine. And then we put the xylokine jelly in the urethra and put the clamp, is the rubber shot, is actually is a sponge clamp. And they lay down there for 20 minutes or so. And when they come to the room, they have an option of nitrous oxide. There's a, something they, they breathe through it like a dentist they use. Make them very comfortable while I'm doing the procedure. They're breathing through it after finish, and that's it. That's it. I, don't, I, I do not, some urologists put injection into the prostate to numb it. I don't do that. And may, most people have abandoned that practice because we don't want to increase in chance of infection and also, that's not fun. We don't need it, actually. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Are there any other technologies technologies you've heard about coming in the next five to 10 years? What might these look like? Well, I'm sure there are lots of lots of uh, technology are developing in the labs in the horizon. Uh, I, I have not heard anything uh, very solid so far, except, you know, water, the latest one is uh, this water pressure. We have two kinds, one they call it robotic water pressure, one the other kind, but it's still nothing more than that. I'm sure the future, something will gonna come up even better than Euroleaf. But at this point, the best invention we have is Euroleaf. Okay, great. And thank you. Let's see another question is, um, how can we tell overactive bladder versus prostate problem for frequent urination? If I would see a gentleman with frequent urination, urgency, stuff like that, and he has a large prostate, but he goes empty the bladder 
in the urethral. This flow is good. I check the bladder. Bladder is uh, no, no, no residual. But people with overactive bladder, they don't have too big bladder. I see on that urethral, the urine that usually a man come with a full bladder has 180, 200 something in the bladder, it has to go. But these, these, these kind of people, they have a smaller bladder. I see he's urinated only with 67, 70, 80, below 100. Of course, good flow. And then if it's good flow, empty the bladder and symptoms is symptoms like a, as, as he mentioned, overactive bladder, totally simple diagnosis. No obstructive element, no residual, and low volume of the blood. This is, this is, I mean, overactive bladder, which is becoming very common now. And as we get older, men and women, they get loss of, and that doesn't require any urolic, doesn't require any surgery. It requires a small pills, which is anticholinergic, relax the bladder, they are fine. Very good. Okay, this is going to be our last question um, for the night. Uh, is your left procedure covered by Medicare? Oh yeah, Medicare love it. <laughs> it's so it's so cheap for Medicare. <laughs> Medicare, you know, Medicare today trying to cut everything. One of the thing Medicare loves to see is don't pay for medication, which is very expensive. Don't pay side effect of medication, very expensive. Don't go to the hospital, very expensive. Don't anesthesia. No hospitalization, nothing like that. So office procedure, any office procedure, Medicare, encourage urologists or other specialists do office procedure. For instance, a vascular surgeon, you pay them more if they do the procedure in the office. Of course, they have to be equipped. And for cystoscopy, they pay me more if I do cystoscopy in the office than doing it in the hospital. In office, I just put the jelly and that's it. In hospital, they have to pay the hospital, they have to pay anesthesia. They, so Euroleaf is their very, they love it. They love you more than anything else. <laughs> okay. Good information. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to all for taking the time to listen and ask questions. And a big thank you to Dr. Ascari for taking the time okay. to provide us with his valuable information. We will be sending a recording of the presentation to all attendees for you to have. We will also be posting this on your face and our Facebook page for everyone to be able to view and share. You can find us at at Little Company of Mary South Bay on Facebook. For any additional information or to schedule a physician appointment, please call our Patient Engagement Center at 1-888-HEALING. Thank you again and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Take care. Bye -bye.